from Kansas State University. This is Agriculture Today. Eric Atkinson here. And ahead for you today from Iowa State University, Lee Schultz provides this week's insight on the cattle markets. In addition to reviewing last week's trading trends, he'll talk about the value of considering a 10-year projection on beef supply and demand. He'll walk through some numbers regarding that in a moment. Also today, K-State's Greg Ibendahl will offer his latest outlook on diesel fuel prices heading into another production year, and he'll talk about the seasonality of fuel prices as a guideline for making fuel purchases for field work. And Jeff Wickman with this week's 4-H segment, where he'll talk with K-State's Beth Hinshaw about the newly assembled State 4-H Youth Leadership Council. All this and more right here on Agriculture Today. Hamburgers, roast, ribs, steak, or whatever you prefer. Beef, it's what's for dinner. Kansas cattle farmers produce 7.5 million head of cattle per year. It takes about 7 tablespoons of peanut butter to get the same amount of protein in one serving of lean beef. Support your local Kansas farmers and ranchers. Eat beef. This message was brought to you by the K-State Animal Sciences Leadership Academy participants. You're listening to Agriculture Today on the K-State Radio Network. Glad to have you aboard on this Monday. For this week's cattle market segment, we turn to a livestock economist out of Iowa State University, Lee Schultz, for his input on a number of things, including the value of looking at this cattle market over the long pull. And we're talking several years' time. More on that in just a second. Lee, as you look back at the trade this past week, there seems to be this sliver of strength moving into the market. Yes, it was higher on the week, really with with the largest increases bookending the ending of the week. Uh, you've seen the, the front six feeder cattle contracts were up anywhere from $1.58 per hundredweight all the way up to $2.3 per hundredweight. Live cattle contracts, similarly, over that contract time period was 1.35 to almost $2 over week ago levels. And so quite a bit of support here. Maybe a little bit surprising seeing the stagnated cash market. Uh, I think we're not, not seeing really the cash pull, the live cattle or feeder cattle futures. We are entering a period here in February where you are seeing likely a pullback in slaughter levels. As you're seeing some plant maintenance going on, that could be a bit supportive. And I think you really have to just point to the demand situation. Box beef prices, even though we did see them wane a little bit last week, are still relatively strong. And I think that's really helping support this market. In fact, as long as that demand persists in a favorable way, that is going to continue to underpin this market, it seems, Lee. It's been going on for a while. That's really what we're seeing, really increasing supplies and really able to hold prices where they're at is that definition of very strong demand. And and I think we're both seeing it here domestically and on the export markets. Domestically, I think we're going to have to see really how this this shapes out, uh, at least the last couple of weeks with this cold weather. I think maybe that did impact consumption a little bit, at least when you look at food service industry. And so, you know, I think maybe did take a little step back here recently, but overall demand has been strong. And speaking of which, the USDA did come out with a a number of agriculture reports last week. Did we have any more clarity on our export status for beef? Well, I'll say yes and no. It's data we probably already knew, but USDA is reporting the actual data. So we did get last week the November trade data. So this is we have now for looking at 2018, the annual January through November 2018, and not too many surprises as, as we look at those numbers. Countries that, that have been up large the last couple of months really maintain that momentum, and really our numbers are, are pinned at about that 11% volume over a year ago. Also, I think more importantly, as value has really maintained. So while we're up 11% by volume, we're up 16% by value. So going back to that demand definition, 
exporters are buying more and they're paying more for it. So that shows how strong demand is on that export market. Let's talk a bit about a couple of articles, actually, that you've put together recently. One, the values of bred cows as we're into this new year, 2019. And you've been looking at some auction prices and noting a a definite trend there. Yes, to see the start of 2019, we've seen lower bred cow values. When you look at different characteristics of those cows, I think you could put it in the range of, of those prices being down 8% to about 25% compared to January of 2018. Now, that's not too surprising given several reasons. I think, one, we have more cows available, so supplies are going to pressure down those prices. But also, I think looking at profitability prospects, I think that's what's maybe really taming those prices down, where you're seeing calf prices here, at least here in Iowa, in January were lower than year ago level. So that's kind of that immediate term impact. But then as you look at the feeder cattle futures prices, uh, those are about trading maybe similarly to a little bit higher for November than they were year ago levels. And so I think there's not a whole lot of optimism for this coming calf crop that those bred cows would be producing. Following up on that, our friends at the Livestock Marketing Information Center are projecting calf prices for the year to be a bit on the downside, not a dramatic drop, but still slightly lower. So that's contributing to this notable fall off in cow values. Yes, I think really that that is that main driver when we look at the profitability prospects, not only this year, but I think there's a general understanding that we're going to see lower prices for the next several years as we've continued to increase beef cattle numbers, and now we're likely to really bid away those profits continually with these larger supplies. So I think it's, yes, looking at the short-term prices in 2019, maybe at best are are similar to year ago levels, but also those prices will likely continue to erode. And that's very important for cow-calf profitability and what I'm willing to pay for a cow in this current market. Lee, you have also put together your insight on the long-term beef cattle market prospects and sizing up the factors there. You think there's worth in producers as well as other market interests, stepping back and taking that longer-term perspective. And we're talking a decade's worth here, right? Yes. You know, I, I, I'm guilty as anyone in really focusing in on the short-term impacts, the supply and demand conditions in the market, and how can we adjust our marketing and even production strategies in the short term. But I think on occasion, maybe even more often than we do, we should take this longer term perspective on the industry because you know that's really what's shaping your operation and some of the decisions that you're making are going to shape your operation for the next 10, 15, 20 years. So thinking about expansion of your cattle herd or making a, a significant capital investment on your operation, yes, the factors impacting the market are important right now, but maybe the factors impacting the market 5, 10, 15 years from now are even more important because that's what's going to need to pay back that investment you've made in your operation. Now, the USDA, for its part, will be coming out with an agricultural projections to the year 2028 report, and there were some preliminary numbers in advance of that that the USDA shared, and you might talk about those. And I want to thank USDA for, for doing that. I always joke with producers that it, it's very difficult to make 10-year projections. And so likely those are going to be revised as we go down the years. And so this at least gives us some numbers to talk about, debate, and at least use in our initial estimates as we make calculations, as we make forecasts for producers being in my place here as an extension specialist and analyst of the the cattle market. When you look at those 10-year projections, I think there's not too many surprises out there from the production side of things. Expected that we're likely to see production up in the next 10 years, 5 to 6 percent. Maybe the demand is is the surprising factor. Now, likely a lot of that increased production is going to be absorbed by exports, but per capita consumption here in the U.S. is forecasted to be about flat. So we're not going to eat any more beef in 2028 than we're eating in 2019. Now, at face value, some people may question that. 
But I, I think it, it's important to really think about what that means. We're likely to hold prices pretty strong because if you've seen prices really fell off, you could see per capita consumption really increase because it's a lot cheaper to buy beef. What's instructive there is I think the industry really needs to look at how do we maintain beef's share of that protein portfolio for consumers and continue to grow demand so that we continue to to at least maintain where this per capita consumption is at. It's a very important thing to consider, as well as the export outlook. And there are some numbers to look at there, too, you say. Yes, exports are are very critical in this component because they're really going to be needed to absorb this additional production, or we're going to see much lower market clearing prices. Now, the U.S. is the primary grain-finished exporter, Um, and is the fourth largest exporter behind Brazil, India, and Australia, which mainly ship grass-finished cattle. Now, why those two definitions are are kind of important, I think, is we're the number fourth because of of price sometimes, right? Grass-fed is cheaper to produce in general than than grain-fed. But when you look at from a quality and consistency standpoint, I think we've seen that grain-fed beef is highly demanded in in the world marketplace. Now, as we've seen income growth in countries increase, we've seen them make a switch from grass-fed beef to grain-fed beef, just like they would do from poultry to pork or pork to beef. And so I think that is why it's rather bullish export forecasts out there that we're likely to see increases is because, one, I think the U.S. producer continues to strive to be more efficient, so we're keeping at least a cap on escalating beef prices, but also that that quality consistency standpoint really competes with everyone in the world market. And so that's why I think we're expected to see large export increases because U.S. product is highly desired on the world market. It's an interesting set of viewpoints on where the markets might be going up to 2028. And folks, if you'd like to see this analysis that Lee has put together, you can simply search for it online, sizing up long-term beef prospects. And we appreciate the comments, Lee. As always, we'll catch up with you again soon. Many thanks. Thank you. Lee Schultz is a livestock economist at Iowa State University, and he's been our guest on this first part of Agriculture Today. What is radon? Home exposure to radon gas is the leading cause of lung cancer death in the United States for non-smokers. In Kansas, one in four homes will test at or above the EPA action level. The Surgeon General recommends all homes be tested and fixed if necessary. Visit kansasradonprogram.org for more information. Test. Fix. Save a life. This message brought to you by the Kansas Radon Program, the Kansas Association of Broadcasters, and this station. Welcome back. You're listening to Agriculture Today. On this segment, we'll talk about cost management in crop production with another cropping season coming up and considerations on one of those main costs that you producers encounter every year. That is the cost of fueling your field operations. Greg Ibendahl has joined us once again, research and extension farm management economist here at K-State. Greg has just recently put out a couple of fact sheets on diesel prices and the seasonality of fuel prices, respectively, and we want to talk about about that uh, information as we visit with him today. But just stepping back a bit, Greg, in your view, what is the magnitude of fuel cost when you look at the breadth of production costs that the crop producer encounters? Well, I don't have that figure right in front of me, but it is a pretty significant part because, you know, any, any machine you use is going to use a fuel on some of those bigger ones. You know, your come on, you probably think it drinks fuel like it's <laughs> going out of style. So right. you, you can run through fuel pretty quickly. And, uh, you know, it's been an interesting time to talk about this because, you know, during the second half of 2018, we saw a, really a big decline in oil prices, which gas kind of follows suit. So, you know, we, we saw a lot of places across the state where you're paying under $2 a gallon for gasoline. So uh, I'm afraid uh, kind of those kind of periods of that that level of gasoline prices may be done for the year, unfortunately. But uh, yeah, that was that was kind of the uh, 
idea behind doing this was we saw a big decline in oil prices, and what does that mean kind of going forward? Let's zoom in on diesel prices, if we might, for a moment. And what we know about the trending in diesel prices, it does correlate quite well with oil prices, just as gas does, right? Yeah, but, yeah both both those uh, fuels, diesel and gasoline, both they both highly correlate with the price of oil. So whatever, you know, you can kind of look at an idea of what, what's been happening with the oil price, and that's a good indicator of what the diesel price is. So my research suggests that uh, – there's basically kind of a three-week lag between what the oil price does and what happens with diesel price, but the correlation is really high. It's like you know above like 0.9 percent, so it's really really up there. As you look at diesel at the current state, how would it compare to the price trends over the last few years? Then, well, really, I think if you look at what the price of oil is and the price of gas and diesel, I think gasoline is really probably lower than what it would be based on what the prediction would say based on oil prices. Whereas diesel may be a little bit higher than what the predicted price would be here. So I, I, you know, over time, the, with this, such a strong correlation between oil price and the gas and diesel price, I really expect those to kind of match up with long-term trends like that. So really, we can kind of look ahead forward what's going to happen with the oil price, and we can kind of get a pretty good idea of what's happening with the uh, gas and diesel price. And based on what the uh, EIA is predicting, they're predicting you know oil prices are probably going to rise maybe about $10 or so over the course of the year, which you know they're, they're kind of being conservative there. They're kind of take what had been happening in the recent past and and project that forward here. But based on that, I think you can probably start to see a little bit of rise, maybe certainly in the gas price, probably in the diesel price too. But you make a distinction here. There might be a, a sharper rise in gasoline prices compared to diesel. Is that yeah, that, that's based on the correlation with the oil price and what the R model would predict what those are. So like I said, uh, based on the end of the year values, I think gasoline was really what was below is what the current oil price would be, whereas diesel is probably a little bit higher. So I think we're likely to see, based on what the historical forecast is, probably a a little bit more rise in diesel prices, but I think a lot bigger rise in the gasoline price. We're not talking about an overwhelming, say, doubling of prices, though, are we? No, not unless something unusual happens. Again, the AI is kind of predicting you know, the current pass is going to go through without any surprises. So, again, they're projecting maybe like a, a $10 increase in the price of oil over the coming year, which, again, is assuming there's no big catastrophe in the world or something like that happens. That would probably be a pretty realistic expectation, again, which would indicate we're probably looking at maybe just a little bit higher overall fuel prices for 2019. There's this other element, and in fact, the other fact sheet that you wrote up is devoted to this, the seasonality of of fuel prices, uh, gasoline as well as diesel, and those trends hold pretty tight over time, don't they? Yeah, I've been looking at this over the last couple of years, and I kind of use a five-year uh, a historical set of numbers looking at that, but there there is some strong seasonality when you look at gasoline and diesel prices because there are certain months out of the year that are going to tend to be higher than other ones. It's really strong on the gasoline side. We almost always see very high prices relative to the yearly price for gasoline during the time from Memorial Day through Labor Day when, when consumers are out there driving and, uh, you know, using their cars a lot more. And, and it tails off during the wintertime when they aren't driving so much. So because of that, those seasonalities, you typically see the gasoline price, you know, be anywhere from maybe, you know, 20 or 30 cents higher during the summertime compared to the yearly average. And during the wintertime, we see, uh, you know, maybe 15 to 20 cents lower during the wintertime. So if you look at those two between, you know, now the Feb- the price now for gasoline for what is in the summer, it's not unusual to see a 40 cent difference between those two sets of prices. Diesel, on the other hand, while it may show some seasonality, it's of a, a different orientation, isn't it? Yeah, it's not near as strong as what the gasoline seasonality is, for one thing. I think that has somewhat to do with the changing nature of diesel fuel. So at one time, you know, uh, when we used to burn a lot of heating oil in the United States and uh, there wasn't really just traditional demand for diesel fuel prices, we saw a strong correlation between the heating oil market and what diesel fuel prices are, which meant that you would have higher prices during the wintertime and lower during the summertime. Well, sometime back in the, uh, I would say, maybe like late 80s, that kind of changed. When we start to see a lot more construction in the U.S., uh, our economy kind of really took off. So now that correlation between diesel fuel prices and heating oil prices really doesn't exist. Uh, The diesel market is really tied to more of what's been happening with the economy. So when the economy is strong, there's more construction being used, more diesel engines out there going. We see higher prices in, and when the economy kind of tails off, then we see lower diesel prices because of that. But even with those two things in consideration, I think there are still some times during the year where there are good times to buy diesel fuel. And one of those may be right around now, you say, as you've calculated month by month that seasonality, so to speak. 
Yeah, I think uh, for you know for farmers, I think it's the seasonality actually hits them kind of bad because the typically the higher times of the year for diesel fuel prices are when the times when farmers are going to need the most of it. So typically, uh, based on what the last five years would show, we're seeing higher prices. Uh, like uh, April through June would be typically above average, and we also see some higher prices like September through uh, November where it's got a little bit above average. Now, the the amount of change isn't like it is for gasoline, so we're looking maybe like at a 5 to 10 cent adjustment over what the average yearly price is, but it is there, and, you know, farmers who are buying diesel fuel on our net's needed basis are probably going to pay higher prices than they would if they would buy it during some other times. Mm -hmm. So one might actually think about, as we are still in the month of February, according to your calculations, advanced pricing diesel for spring field work needs right around now? Yeah, I would say so. I mean, February typically is actually one of our lowest prices a month compared to the yearly average, so now would be a great time to buy fuel for your spring planting season if you could have a, way, have a way to store it. Now, the other good thing with the seasonality for diesel prices, is it has really like two periods where it's high and two periods where, where it's lower. So if you buy your spring fuel now, uh, like in February, early March, you can tend to save a few cents per gallon compared to what it's going to be like in May or June. And the other good thing, too, is July and August tend to be lower times to buy diesel fuel, too. So really, you can buy your your spring fuel a couple months in advance, and you'll, you'll have your spring uh, cost covered, and then you can buy your fall fuel for fall harvesting like in July or August, and those are going to be lower times as well. So you might want to target one or both of those uh, windows of opportunity for pricing and use whatever mechanisms are available to you. If one can bulk store their entire needs, so be it. But uh, negotiating with the supplier might be the other route. Yeah, I think so. You know, farmers are probably reluctant to spend any money ahead of time when they don't have to. I mean, fuel is going to be certainly be a big chunk of your expenses. And, you know, topping off all your tanks now could be a little expensive proposition when, when things may be a little tight because of some other reasons with farming here. But, you know, certainly long-term perspective, you know, I, I would I would not be afraid to go ahead and buy some fuel now in February. Seek out whatever arrangements are available. To oh, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. Certainly that. And, you know, shop around as much as you can. You know, certainly look for, look for prices, chances to buy, you know, fuel as low as you can. Now, you note in your write-up that this is all based on what we see normally. <laughs> and if something comes in that's out of the norm, that could cast these seasonal trends a bit askew. Right. Yeah, I mean, if you look at my December number, so to historically for diesel fuel prices, December is, you know, about 10 cents lower than the yearly average. But December is also the month with the largest amount of variability into it, too. So over the last five years, we have seen two years where the December price for diesel was 40 cents below the season or the yearly average. And then we also saw two years where it was 30 cents above the yearly average here. So quite a range in there. So, But it turns out that when you average those together, you get about 8 to 10 cent below the yearly average here. So December, very volatile when it comes to uh, diesel fuel prices. Mm -hmm. Now, one thing I noticed on this on my graph, too, is in August, for some reason, the last five years, we almost always have the yearly average price in August for diesel fuel. So I'm not sure what that means, if you can do anything with that set of information. But mm -hmm. it is to me, that was kind of an interesting set of numbers that stuck out about that. Yeah. So the point here is that you want producers to start thinking in terms of managing these costs and be aware of the trends so maybe they can, in these tight economic times, shave some expenses off of their operations. Yeah, and, you know, in any given year where I told you, you know, it may not hold out, but I think if you look at enough years, you know, five to ten years uh, planning horizon, yeah, you're, you're, you're going to pay less by buying in February. So, that you know, that's a good thing to happen. It may, may not save you a whole lot of money. It may save you, you know, five to ten to fifteen cents a gallon, but over, you know, the amount of diesel fuel most farmers use, that can be a significant savings. No doubt about it. Well, producers, we'd invite you to have a look at both of these fact sheets that Greg has put together. One is directly on the diesel price outlook for 2019. The other addresses this seasonality in fuel prices that can help you understand where those may be headed here in 2019 as well. Both of those are posted on the agmanager.info website. Appreciate these analyses. Greg, thank you for coming over. Thanks for Farm management economist, K-State Research and Extension, Greg Ibendahl authored these articles. Agmanager.info is where they can be found once more. We'll be back with more on this agriculture today. This is the K-State Radio Network. While many people know hunger is an issue in developing countries, it is also a problem in our own backyards. In 2010, one in seven Kansans struggled to put adequate food on the table. Two K-State Research and Extension programs are tackling this problem. The Family Nutrition Program and Expanded Food and Nutrition Education Program reach thousands of Kansans and more than 70 counties. They learn how to eat healthy with a low budget. 
For more information about these programs, visit ksre.ksu.edu. Agriculture Today is back now here on the K-State Radio Network. Eric Atkinson with you. Once more, glad to have you along as we turn to today's agricultural news page and these headlines now. Courtesy in part of DTN. Well, Friday's round of USDA grain supply and demand reports had market watchers full attention. The USDA's Gary Crawford has this recap. Many analysts expected USDA to lower its estimates of 2018 crop production, and in general, that's what happened in Friday's round of reports and forecasts. Wheat stocks December 1st, up 7% from a year earlier. No change in the average price forecast, 510 a bushel. Corn, USDA slightly reducing its estimate for final 2018 production and for stocks, which on December 1st were 12 billion bushels, 5% less than a year earlier. Soybeans, again, a slight drop in USDA's estimate of 2018 crop at 4. billion bushels. December 1 stocks up 18% from a year ago. Cotton, USDA lowering estimates in every category, production, use, stocks, and prices. Gary Crawford for the U.S. Department of Agriculture, Washington. Now narrowing it down to the 2018 crop production summary for Kansas expressly, corn production in the state, the final numbers based on year-end surveys, estimated at 645 million bushels. That was down 6% from 2017. The corn yield at 129 bushels, down 3 bushels per acre from the previous year. And the corn acreage was down 4% from 2017, right at 5 million acres. Grain sorghum, 2018, estimated at 223 million bushels, up 16% from 2017. The yield at 88 bushels, up 6 from the year earlier. And the acreage of sorghum, 2.65 million acres, up 8% from 2017. Soybean production for 18, totaling a record high, 204 million bushels, up 7% from 2017. The yield at 43.5 bushels per acre, up 6 bushels from a year earlier. And the acreage of soybeans in the state, 4.7 million, down 8%. From 2017. Canola production in Kansas, 33.6 million pounds, down 46% from 2017. The yield of 960 pounds, down 360 pounds from a year earlier, and the acreage down 12,000, 35,000 acres total. Cotton production, a record high in Kansas last year, 342,000 bales, up 74% from 2017, with a yield of 1,066 pounds per acre, up 15 pounds from a year earlier. And the USDA is reporting this year the second smallest winter wheat crop acreage planted since records began and the fewest since 1909. The USDA's Rod Bain. Friday was the Agriculture Department's first look at this season's winter wheat plantings. And Chief Economist Rob Johansson says... We do see winter wheat planted acres coming at 31.3 million acres, down 4% year over year. That was mostly due to weather conditions at the time. We had some poor planting conditions. Johansson says that continues a recent trend of decreasing winter wheat planted acres. And for this season... That will be the second lowest planted acres ever going back to 1909. Record lows in Nebraska, New Jersey, Ohio, and West Virginia. Lowest in Kansas since the 50s. 1957 in Kansas to be exact. Oklahoma is reporting its lowest winter wheat planted acreage since 1943, while Texas winter wheat growers plant their smallest acreage since 1972. By class, hard red winter wheat planting acreage is expected down 3% nationwide. Soft red winter 7% less from the year before. And white winter wheat seeded area down 3% from the previous year. A broad Bain reporting for the U.S. Department of Agriculture in Washington, D.C. Resolving the current trade war so that China lifts tariffs on U.S. soybean imports must be a key outcome for the ongoing talks between the two countries. The American Soybean Association stated that in a news release. ASA President Davy Stevens calls Chinese Vice Premier Liu's commitment to purchase an additional 5 million tons of U.S. beans encouraging, but says that purchases alone are not the answer. Seeing an agreement at the end of the 90-day period that specifically rescinds the tariffs that Chinese have imposed on U.S. soybean imports remains ASA's top priority, in his words. 
Next up for you on Agriculture Today, the weekly feature from the Kansas Forest Service here at Kansas State University. Tree Tales, standing by as K-State Forester Bob Atchison. Bob? Kansas winters can be hard on livestock, and farmers and ranchers who are smart enough to establish good tree windbreaks for their cattle and dairy operations are saving money on feed costs, weight loss, and milk production. With beef cattle, a heavy winter coat will provide protection until temperatures drop below 18 degrees. At that point, cattle become stressed and require additional feed to maintain body temperatures. Wind chill is a huge factor. A 25 mile per hour wind at zero degrees creates a wind chill of 44 degrees below zero. By contrast, a properly designed windbreak will reduce the same wind chill to 15 degrees below. Still dangerous to young animals, but much less of a problem for mature cattle. Kansas cattle producers indicate that, on average, calving success is increased by 2% if cows are protected by a windbreak. Canadian researchers found that cattle on winter range and unprotected sites require a 50% increase in feed for normal activities and an additional 20% increase to overcome the direct effects of exposure to a combination of cold temperatures and wind. A properly designed windbreak will reduce these needs by half. Researchers at Purdue University found that energy requirements for cows in good condition increased 13% for each 10-degree drop in wind chill below 30 degrees. A similar study in Iowa on calves and yearlings indicated that requirements for feed were 7% greater for those in open lots than for similar animals with shelter. Studies in Montana indicated that during mild winters, beef cattle sheltered by windbreaks gained an average of 34 to 35 pounds, more than cattle in an open feedlot. During severe winters, cattle in feedlots protected from the wind maintained 10.6 more pounds than cattle in unprotected lots. The Kansas Forest Service is now accepting tree orders from producers interested in establishing livestock windbreaks and Kansas Forest Service foresters are available to assist with windbreak planning and design. For more information, contact Kansas Forest Service at 785-532-3300. Check us out on the web at www.kansasforest.org. This is Bob Atchison with the Kansas Forest Service, reminding you of some of the benefits windbreaks provide to Kansas agricultural industry. You've been listening to another tree tale. Thanks, Bob. And a quick reminder to subscribe to the podcast of our daily broadcast. Go to agtoday.net. That's agtoday.net. And this is Agriculture Today. Legal and financial concerns surround the day-to-day management of the agricultural industry. Producers, ag creditors, and USDA agencies rely on Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. If you've received an adverse decision from the USDA or have an ag credit concern, call today, 800-321-3276, or visit us online, Kansas Agricultural Mediation Services. Exploring options, generating solutions. This is Agriculture Today. I'm Jeff Wickman. A new state 4-H Youth Leadership Council was elected late last year and attended a retreat and orientation last month where they elected officers. Southeast Area 4-H Specialist Beth Hinshaw says those council members will be very active in the coming months. Beth, the elections were held in November, but the orientation and retreat was just last month. That's correct. Um, We have uh, kicked off our new Kansas 4-H Youth Leadership Council year, that first weekend in January, we had a retreat out at Rock Springs 4-H Center. Tell us a little bit about the process. How did the people get elected? That happens at our Kansas Youth Leadership Forum, and that's always in November. The council is made up of young people who run to represent their area in the state, and then also young people who apply and are selected to go to National 4-H Conference. So we have young people who were elected to their seats, and then we have some young people who were also selected through application and interviews. Do you always have the same number of officers, or does it vary? We always have this 
potential of the same number, but it depends really on how many young people get selected for a national conference. This year, we actually have 21 total on the council. Tell us a little bit about what the council does. The council has a number of responsibilities, and that's really grown over the years. We're just about to our 20th year, and their first activity of the year is always citizenship in action. And that's coming up later this month over the Sunday and Monday of President's Day. Uh, We have one of our largest crowds coming to that, and that's an opportunity to work on some mock legislation in a role as like a representative or a senator, and then also to go into the Capitol and meet with their senators and their representatives to talk with them about their 4-H program and then also concerns that they have. Then in in the summer, we have Camp Friends, which is an event for 12 to 14-year-olds, and it's one of those kind of bridging or tween kind of activities, like you're too old for 4-H camp, but maybe you don't feel comfortable heading off to Discovery Days or one of those larger events. So it's kind of that opportunity to have all the great fun of 4-H camp, but also start into some leadership workshops and some other kinds of things like you'll be experiencing later in your 4-H career. And, you know, it's that opportunity to really work with those young people at Camference on that belonging and mastery and independence and generosity, all those things that we do in 4-H. But we know that young people in middle school are starting to have lots of other opportunities. And so we want them to connect with 4-H as much as possible because we'd like them to continue to stay with us. And then you have a couple of other activities as well. We do. We're always at the State Fair on both weekends with the Youth Council. They have a booth and they typically help us with some t-shirts that are with whatever our marketing campaign is at the time and then answering questions about 4-H and about their activities that they host each year. 48 Hours of 4-H is our big service event, which happens in October. That's at the end of National 4-H Week. And then the last event of the year is the Kansas Youth Leadership Forum, and that is in November. So what exactly are they learning through all of these various activities? They learn a lot of different things. One is certainly event management, you know, like how to put something together from start to finish and, you know, how to really put themselves in the shoes of those young people who are coming to their events and activities. But I think through all of that, they learn a lot about themselves as well, what their leadership capabilities are. They learn about civic engagement and how, you know, how they want to be engaged, not only at the state level, but in their community as well. I know you said there are 21 on the council, but I'm assuming you have some leadership positions within the council? We do. Each of those activities that I talked about actually has a chairperson. And so that's one level of leadership. And I think most of them have a vice chair as well. We actually elect officers for the council. So this year, Emily Glenn from Scott County is our president. Our vice president is Stacy Elliott, and she is from Pottawatomie County. Our secretary is Jacob Schmeidler, and he's from the Cottonwood District. And then our final elected office is Lauren Terry, and she's from the Meadowlark District, and she is our public relations director. And were they elected by the other members on the council? How did that work? Yes, that's what we do on, we meet all day Saturday and then on Sunday morning after they've gotten to to get acquainted and learn about each other, then we hold our officer elections. And do they campaign or is this a little bit more of a friendly thing? Um, It's friendly, but certainly um, we go through all that regular parliament procedure with people being nominated, people talking in front of the group about why it is they're interested in the position and then the formal balloted election process. Everything that we would expect from an election. Yeah, exactly. It's it's very much like what we see in our 4-H clubs, which, you know, we love that because we think that's an important part of civic engagement. You know, we want young people to be voters someday and, you know, what better training them to start doing that in their 4-H club and then have other opportunities in the other groups that they're a part of. And then they'll have a chance to go back and pass along what they're learning through the council with their own 4-H clubs. Yes, and that's really important to us, that not only are these young people leaders on the state level, but we want them 
taking that knowledge back and sharing with the young people in their own communities as well. So if someone is interested in learning a little bit more about leadership activities, they don't necessarily have to be on the council. They can learn a lot of that through 4-H. Oh, most definitely. And leadership is actually one of the projects that young people can take as well. If people are interested in the Kansas Youth Leadership Council, they can see that information on our website and the election and the selection process for national conference, all of that information goes up in the summertime, usually late July or early August, with typically an October 1 deadline. So, you know, we have some time to think about it, but, you know, it's like anything else. If you're going to do it, you really ought to start thinking about it and start learning about it as well. And these are great experiences, a chance to do some traveling, and you would really encourage 4-Hers to take advantage of this. You know, I encourage 4-Hers to take advantage of all the opportunities that make sense for them and that present themselves. So most definitely, I think being on the council is a wonderful opportunity for young people. But, you know, if that's not for you, you know, take the opportunity and go to Discovery Days. Take the opportunity and run for an office in your local 4-H club. There are opportunities at all levels. That's Southeast Area 4-H Specialist Beth Hinshaw. Again, for more information, go to kansas4h.org. And that'll do it for this edition of Agriculture Today. Along with Eric Atkinson, I'm Jeff Wickman. This is the K-State Radio Network.